Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. First, lots of Fabrengen. So the first thing you do by Fabrengen is make a Lachayim. So I'm going to make a Lachayim for those that have it, or those that should have it, or want to have it, or, you know, if you want it, it's like you consider as if you did it. Not really, but Lachayim. Lachayim, everybody. Everybody should be blessed with an abundance of all the lessons of Pesach Sheni. As we'll learn, there's a lot of very, very interesting, important lessons from Pesach Sheni in the Fabrengen. And everybody should be blessed with health, wealth, happiness, all good things. We should be able to get out of this uh, golos and uh, not only get back to the shul, but go back to the real shul with Mashiach, Lachayim. Okay, um, it's about Pesach Sheni, obviously. So I want to begin just telling everybody what happened on Pesach Sheni. Like, where does Pesach Sheni originate from? In Parshas Baal which is the third parsha in the book of Bamidbar, in chapter 9, the Pasuk says, before Pesach Sheni, the Torah gives a brief introduction. And it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe in the desert of Sinai, the second year in the first month. Okay, so it was the second year in the first month. What was it that the Jews made Pesach in its time? And Tarashi asks the question here. This is not in passing. It's very important to know this. Rashi says, this Pasik is out of order. Because this Pasik is in the second year when the Jews left Egypt and in the uh, first month. The beginning of the book of Bamidbar, the beginning of the book of Bamidbar, it says, when did Hashem do it? And the second month of the second year. So the beginning of Parshish Bamidbar, the beginning of the book of Bamidbar, is the second year in the second month. This parsha is the second year, the first month. So this story happened a month before the beginning of the book. The Rashi says this teaches us a muktam umochar batera. There's no chronological order in Torah. Torah does things a lot of times out of order. So Rashi said, but why? Why does the Torah do it out of order? The Rashi says because this over here, speaks negative about the Jews. Negative about the Yidin. The Gnus and Shal Yisrael. The negativity of the Jews. Why? Because Rashi says for the whole 40 years the Jews were in the desert, they only did one Pesach. Besides the one in Egypt, they only did one more Pesach in the second year. So it's negative. If it's negative, the Torah doesn't want to begin the book of Bamidbo. So the obvious question is, and this is a very important question that the Rebbe asks, why is that negative? The Jews were told when they left Egypt, there's one Pesach to do, and then the next one is when you come to Eretz Yisrael 40 years later. So the question is, they weren't even obligated to do it. So why is that the negativity of the Jews that they didn't bring the only one carbon Pesach in the desert? They weren't obligated to bring it. What do you want from them? Hashem said the first initial Pesach, one more Pesach in the desert, the first year, and then no more Pesach until 40, 40 years later, 39 years later. So Rashi says this is negativity that they only brought one. So the Rebbe asked, what do you mean? They weren't supposed to bring any more. What was the negative about? And we'll see that later. And then the Pasuk continues. The so Jews did the carbon paste of the Paschal Lamb. And then the Torah says, anoshim, There were men. I show you, They were impure. And we learned before the Pasuk says, If you're impure, you cannot bring the carbon paste. You cannot bring the Paschal Lamb. So these people came to Moshe Rabbeinu who were impure. And they said, we're impure. Lama nigara, why should we suffer? Why are we worse than everybody else that we can bring the Paschal Lamb? 
it's our fault that we're tummy. The interesting discussion in the Gemara and Sukkah, who were these people that were tummy? Who were they? So one opinion says the people that carried Yosef's coffin out of Egypt. So they were holding the coffin, they were tummy. Another opinion says Mishal and al the two cousins of Aaron, when Nadav and Avil died, and Rosh Chodesh Nisan, Nadav and Avil died, like we learned in Pasha Shmini, and they were told to take care of the body, so they were impure. Another opinion in the Gemara says, no, those people could have purified themselves. Who were these impure people? People that came in contact with what's called a tummy mace. A tummy mace means a person, you find a dead body in the street, you have an obligation to go bury it. No matter who you are, even a Kohen, doesn't matter. You have to bury it. So these people happened to come about a dead person and they buried it. So there were people that were impure. They come to Meshach Rabbeinu and they say, why should we suffer? Why are we worse than everybody else? We also want to bring a carbon Pesach. So Meshach Rabbeinu said to them, and this is an unbelievable greatness of Meshach Rabbeinu, Im duvi ashma, stand, wait, let me ask God what he wants me to do. And Rashi says, look how lucky Meshach Rabbeinu was whenever he wanted to speak to Hashem, Hashem spoke to him. So what did he do? Meshach Rabbeinu says to Hashem, what's the story? So Hashem said to him, David al-Bnei Yisrael Lamer, speak to the Jewish people. And you're going to say to them, Ish ish kiya nefesh, if a person will be impure, or bederich rechaika, or far away from Yerushalayim, that they didn't have a chance for the first Pesach to bring the Paschal Lamb. Lachem, even if it was, as it's defined, intentional. So Hashem said, you know what? We're giving you Pesach Sheni. A month later, on the 14th, of Eor, which is tonight and tomorrow, you're going to bring, be able to bring the carbon Pesach. Okay, so this is where the whole concept of carbon Pesach came. Carbon Pesach was, Hashem told the Jews to keep Pesach. The Jews kept Pesach, but they were Tommy, some people, they came to Meshav Ben and they said, why should we suffer? Hashem says, Meshav Ben, they're right. I'm giving them a second chance. This is the story of Pesach Shem. There's an argument in the Gemara, in fact, there's three opinions, but I just want to discuss two points over here of this, because it's relevant to the whole concept of Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni, there's two ways of looking at it. One way of looking at Pesach Sheni is, it's a makeup. You blew the first one, for whatever reason it is, you couldn't bring it. So Hashem says, you have a makeup date. It's a makeup of the first. Rabbi holds in the Gemara, it's regal b'fnei atzmei. It's a separate yomtiv. It's a separate yomtiv. It's not a makeup of the first. It's a separate yomtiv. What's the difference? So, commentaries explain. The difference is very simple. If somebody converts to Yiddishkeit between the first Pesach and the second Pesach, Okay, first Pesach, he was a guy, and then two weeks later, he converted. Now he's a Jew. Is he obligated in bringing a Pesach Sheni or not? Or a child that became Bar Mitzvah or Bas Mitzvah in the middle of, between the first Pesach and the second Pesach, and their family didn't count them in on the first carbon Pesach, do they have to bring a new carbon Pesach now? So the, the concept is very simple. If it's a makeup, so they didn't have to bring the first, they don't have to make it up. If you hold it's a separate jumtiv, then they have to bring it. There's a new obligation, a new mitzvah, you have to bring a carbon Pesach. And Allah is, by the way, the Rambam says that a convert who converted or a kid that became bar, bar bas mitzvah during Svira, between first Pesach and second Pesach, have to bring the carbon Pesach. In other words, it's not only a makeup, it's also something additional. And this we're gonna see later is very, very important in our lessons of Pesach Sheni and how we should live, especially today. 
So it's a famous Hayyam Yayim. The Rebbe writes in Hayyam Yayim on Pesach Sheni, okay, which is Yudalit Iyer. The Rebbe writes like this. Um, Pesach Sheni, I'm going to translate it from the Yiddish. Pesach Sheni is, it's never, no, you're never lost. He's talking for foul, meaning there's nothing ever lost. You can all, you can always fix what you missed. There's no such thing as a lost cause. You could be, remember right, you could be pure, impure, I mean, spiritually speaking. You could be impure of Yiddishkeit. You could be far away from Yiddishkeit. And Rebbe writes, even if it's Lachem, it's your intentional reason to be impure from Yiddishkeit and far away from Yiddishkeit. It could be a, your choice of doing that. He says, Das Igevan, from Deswegen, Kem in Mesakin sein. The Rebbe says, what's Pesach Sheni from the previous Rebbe? He writes, Pesach Sheni teaches a Jew, it's never too late. It's never too late. As bad as you are, you could be far from Yiddishkeit, you could be impure from Yiddishkeit, not only physically, spiritually. You could be far away from Yiddishkeit, you could be impure from Yiddishkeit, you could be willingly far and impure from Yiddishkeit. Pesel Shani says, it's never too late. Okay, now, the Rebbe basically explains this, to use a one-liner in English, and then I'm going to explain it. Basically, the Rebbe says, you know what Pesach Sheni teaches us? To find what you didn't lose. Normally, you lose something, you need to find it. Pesach Sheni, the Rebbe explains, is a separate yamtif. It means that he, you can find something that you didn't even lose. What does that mean? You can look and you can get something more than what you had before. And I'll explain this with the story of the Alter Rebbe. Um, when Alter Rebbe was in prison, you know, Yutas Kislev's story, so the opponents of the Alter Rebbe had a lot of questions on, on the Baal Shem Tev and on the Alter Rebbe's teaching. They had a lot of problems with it. And they asked if the Alter Rebbe would debate them, would answer their questions. So the Alter Rebbe agreed. They came to the Alter Rebbe and they said the following question. It says in the Zohar, which is the secrets of Torah, Chassidus and Kabbalah, that Mashiach is going to la sova sadikaya betiyufto. What's Mashiach going to do? The Zohar says, Mashiach is going to get tzaddikim to do tshuva. So the opponents of Hasidus, the Misnagdim as they were called, asked the Alter Rebbe, what you're doing is actually degrading the tzaddik. If you're telling me, this is what they asked the Alter Rebbe, if you're telling me that a tzaddik needs to do tshuva, that means basically you're sinning, you're telling me they're sinning, and they need to do tshuva. That's what you're saying. A tzaddik has to do tshuva. That's what Mashiach is going to do. What's Mashiach going to do, the Zara says? Get tzaddikim to do tshuva. Taking it face value, it means tzaddikim sin, and they're going to have to do tshuva. Who's going to get them to do tshuva? Mashiach. How can you say such a thing? And the Altarebbe answered, I don't want to elaborate on this now, but the Altarebbe answered, and he brought a proof from Meshach Rabbeinu that the concept of tshuva is not for sins necessarily. Tshuva is to reach a level through tshuva that a tzaddik couldn't reach, even if you didn't sin. La sove tzaddikai v'tiyuf, the Dalt Rebbe explained, what does that mean? That the tzaddik, not because he sins and he has to do tshuva, the tshuva of a Jew, the tshuva of a tzaddik is to reach a higher level than the level of a tzaddik, to reach the level of a bal tshuva. 
What does this mean? What's the difference between the first Pesach and the second Pesach, Pesach Sheni? Think about it. Pesach Sheni, Pesach Rishon, the Jews left Mitzrayim. Newborn babies, as Igmar says, they were like born, the Yenavi Yechesko calls the Pesach the birthday of the Jews. The Jews were born. They were complete tzaddikim. A tzaddik. Pure, close to Hashem. That's what Pesach Rishon symbolizes. What does Pesach Sheni symbolize? Pesach Sheni says you were tame, you're impure spiritually, you're far away from God, and for you it's never too late. What does that mean? That's the level of tshuva. The first Pesach represents the level of tzaddikim, and the second Pesach represents the level of a Baal tshuva. And this explains an interesting halacha. By Pesach Rishon, by the first Pesach, the din was you're not allowed to have any chametz in the house. Out of Pesach midday, the day before Pesach midday, which was the time of bringing the carbon Pesach, they were not allowed to have any chametz in the house. Pesach Sheni, the Torah doesn't say anything. So the Gemara says, Chametz imay babayis. When the guy brought the Pesach Sheni, because he didn't bring the first Pesach, he was allowed to have Chametz in the house. Question is why? For him, this is Pesach Rishon. He didn't bring the first Pesach. He's bringing now Pesach Sheni. So it should have the same law. It shouldn't have chametz in the house. Why is it the first Pesach, he was not allowed to have chametz? And the second Pesach, Pesach Sheni, he's allowed to have chametz in the house. Why is that? And this is all relevant, by the way, for us in, in, in serving Hashem, as we'll get to soon. Chametz symbolizes evil. Chametz symbolizes haughtiness, it blows up. Matzah symbolizes humility, bittel. Chametz symbolizes blown up, ego. In fact, the Gemara calls the Yetzirah, Se'erd Shabi'isa, the yeast of the dough, is another name in the Gemara for the Yetzirah. Why? Because that's what makes it rise. Chametz, evil. When the Jews left Egypt, the Pasik says, Pari was told, Ki varach ha'am. The Jews ran out of Egypt. Why did they have to run out of Egypt? They couldn't go slow. Pari was them to go. Pari wasn't going to chase them initially. So Kabbalah and Chassidus explains, yes, the Jews left Egypt, but they were still connected to evil. You know, a person who's addicted to cigarettes or to drugs or to alcohol and they want to get away from it, they must be an extremist. They can't be near cigarettes. They can't even, even cheat once because it's not, then it's not going to work. When the Yidin left Mitzrayim, Chassidus and Kabbalah explained, they were still connected to evil. Yes, there were newborn babies. Yes, there were a newborn nation. Yes, they were running out of Egypt, but they had to run out. Why? Because they were still connected to evil. Evil, therefore, when it comes to Pesach, is problematic. Pe chametz and Pesach is problematic because you have to be an extremist to get away from the chametz. Pesach Sheni because the Torah says it's never too late. You can always come back. It means no matter how bad you are, chametz will not get in your way of a Pesach Sheni. It's never too late. You could be intentionally far, you could be intentionally impure. Pesach Sheni gives the Jews 
an unbelievable power that no matter how bad you are, chametz in your house won't affect you. And this concept explains another major issue. This whole story here sounds strange. Hashem gave him the laws of carbon Pesach. Okay? And then the people said, oh, we're impure, help us out. And Meshav ben had to get, why didn't God give the law to begin with? When Hashem gave the laws of Pesach, Hashem knew there were going to be people that were impure. Yet, what did Hashem do? He told them the laws of the first Pesach. Then a scenario came up. People came and they said, why are we losing out? Why do we have to suffer? Then they got the law of Pesach Sheini. Why couldn't that come directly from Hashem? When Hashem gave the laws of Pesach, tell them the laws of Pesach Sheini already. Hashem knew what was going to be. So the Rebbe explains certain things got to come from us, not from Hashem. When things come from us, it's much, much greater than when it comes from Hashem. Why? Because when it comes from us, that means we mean it. We mean it because we're asking for it. You know the difference between kids going to school or adults going to a shir? Kids go to school because they have to go. Adults don't have to go to a class. They want to go to a class. So of course, when it's from above, it's great, but it's not as great as when it comes from the person himself or herself. And therefore, Hashem said to me, Hashem said, this concept of Pesach Sheni, which means no matter how bad you are, you're still close. It's never too late. You're never too far. You're never impure. That level can't, so to speak, come from Hashem himself. Hashem says it got to come from us. When we do it, when we ask for it, then we reach a level that the tzaddik, so to speak, the tzaddik that Hashem is giving the Torah to, that doesn't happen. They don't get it. You can't have it if it doesn't come from you. And that's how the Rebbe explains what we asked before. Rashi says, the Torah doesn't want to start the Chumash Bamidbar with this story because it speaks about the negativity of the Jews that they only kept one Pesach in the desert. And we said, the Rebbe asked, but they weren't obligated to keep it. They weren't obligated to keep it. What's the answer the Rebbe explains? That itself is the problem. Yes, they weren't obligated to keep it. But the Jews should have come and screamed, we want to do it. We want to keep the Pesach every year. The people, the few people that were impure, the question, how many of them? One, two, three, whatever their amount is. Those people that came, Hashem gave them a special parsha in the Chumash that's so remarkable because the Torah says it's never too late. No matter how bad you are, you can always get close. What was Hashem upset about? Hashem was upset why the Jews in the desert didn't beg Hashem. Why don't you let us do the Pesach every year? Yearly, we should be allowed to keep the carbon Pesach. We find the same thing with the daughters of Tzalafchad. The daughters of Tzalach had seemingly were out of inheritance. And they came to Meshach Rabbeinu screaming, no, we want to be, we want a, a part of Eretz Yisrael. We want to have a portion in Eretz Yisrael. So Hashem said, you know what? You're getting an extra portion of the Chumash. You're getting a whole chapters of Gemara dealing with the inheritance of girls, of daughters. Who made it happen? Not from Hashem. 
the nice Tzilavchad came and screamed, we want part in Eretz Yisrael. These people came and screamed, we want to bring the carbon Pesach. But we don't let us. Hashem, they could have said, you know what they could have said? You know, God, you don't want us to? Okay, we won't bring it. It's not my problem. You told us if you're Tame, you're impure, you can't bring it. Okay, so we won't bring it. That's it. What, is that? what did they come along and they say? No. No, that's not what we want. We want to bring the carbon Pesach. We want to be able to bring the carbon Pesach, even though you said we can't, but we want to do it anyway. What was the negativity about the Jews? Not that they didn't bring the carbon Pesach. They weren't obligated to bring the carbon Pesach. But why didn't they demand to bring it? The same thing that I've been mentioned many times about the concept of Mashiach. People are saying, you know, Rebbe came out, we want Mashiach now, it's imminent, we want Mashiach, you know, the whole thing. So there are people that are saying, by very religious people, listen, what are we bugging God about? He wants to bring Mashiach, he'll bring Mashiach. When he's good and ready, he'll bring Mashiach. Why do we have to mix into God's business? Why should we mix into God's business? The answer is because God wants us to mix into his business. Not in negative things, in positive things. Hashem says, I want you to mix into my business. And therefore, the gad that became a Jew at, between the first two Pesachs, a child that became a Bar Mitzvah or Bas Mitzvah, they have an obligation to bring the carbon paste. But where did it come from? It came from them came from them, and that's what Hashem wants. What does this mean for us? Before we get into not being able to go to show, let me tell you a story with Rav Hilopadachit. There's something called Kiddush Levana. Kiddush Levana is, you know, once a month, the men go out and say the bracha and the moon. So in California, we don't have too much of a problem. Winter, summer, there's always, uh, more or less, there's always a Levana. In Russia, winter time, it was a miracle if you found a Levana. You know, it was very, very difficult. Remember one year in New York, it was Tishrei time. It was coming almost the last night to be able to do Kiddush Levana. So then the Baba Vereber, Rav Shleim Shalom, the Baba Vereba hired a plane. He took to see them on a plane. They went over the clouds and they did Kiddush Levan. The Rebbe waited for the last night. The Levana came out and the Rebbe did Kiddush Levan. But anyway, so in, in Russia, there was no, uh, many times there was no moon. The Bilo Padacher was a very great chassid of the Mittal Rebbe and the Tzemach Sedek. He said he was such a great chassid that he was half rebbe, half chassid. That's what chassidim used to say. He was so, he was, there were other chassidim, bigger chassidim than him because he was 50% rebbe, 50% chassid. And he's one of the few chassidim that said, my modem, and the rebbe brings his chassidus down in, in his my modem. The Philopatra was a very great man, super fanatically from. Okay, there's millions of stories with his from kind. There's one winter, there was no moon, and it was getting late. He went over to the Tzemach Sedek. He wrote a pinion, you know, paper into the Tzemach Sedek. And he said to the Tzemach Sedek, Rebbe, if you don't produce the moon, I will not be able to survive living. I will die from it, from my aggravation. Get me a moon. And the way the story goes, it's Samach said he got him a moon. Okay, and he did Kiddush Levan. Just think for a minute. It's his fault there's no moon? Who made the clouds? Hashem made the clouds. It's our fault that there's no Levana. Hashem said, if there's clouds, I'm, who, who's not letting us do the Levana? Hashem is not letting us do Kiddush Levan. We, we, we want to do Kiddush Levana. Hashem's not letting us. So a normal Jew normal from Jew will say, listen, 
What do you want? I'm not obligated halachically to fly above the clouds and do Kiddush Levana. I, I didn't, I can't do it, I can't do it. By the Bill of Paracher, it was relevant to his life that if he couldn't do Kiddush Levana, which is not even a biblical mitzvah, it's not even a rabbinic mitzvah, it's a bracha that we say, well, okay, maybe rabbinic. But what happened? It, it was a, he was about to die from it. The Bhilo Padacha once came to the Tamach Sadiq a different time. And he said, Rebbe, I need, you must, I'm, I need to hear a mimer, a Tzachsidic discourse from you. I, I must hear it from you. I can't, I can't. Tamach Sadiq said, I don't feel well. I can't say now a mimer. By a Rebbe, it's a lot of work saying a mimer, spiritually. The bill said, I, you have to say in my mouth, I, I can't, pay, I won't be able to live. So Samach Sadiq said, I, it's hard for me to talk. I can't talk. So the bill of Parish said to the Samach Sadiq, Rebbe, do me a favor. I'm going to go into your room. I want you to think a mimer. I will stand in the room. I will listen to your thoughts. Tzamech Sadiq said, that I could do. So Rabbi Hilopadich went into the Tzamech Sadiq. Tzamech Sadiq put on his, you know, kapote, whatever it was. And he thought a mimer. And Rabbi Hilopadich went out and repeated the mimer. Okay. So he wouldn't hear a mimer. There's so many other mimerim that he could learn. So he didn't hear a mimer. By the Bill of Padacher, not hearing a mimer when he was in the mood, so to speak, when he needed it, there was no such thing as just not doing it. And this is what Hashem wants. So let's get into Pesach Sheni a little bit, a practical level. Now I want to talk a little bit for the remaining time, the practical level of Pesach Sheni for us, now that we know what it's all about. You know, there's an expression, Mesiris Nefesh can mean jumping off the roof. Okay. Mesiris Nefesh doesn't mean jumping from the ground to the roof. That's impossible. Mesiris Nefesh means, okay, I risk my life. It's very difficult to do it. I'll do it. What happens if Hashem puts us in a predicament that we can't do it? And many times by the classes, by the I gave this much, I'm going to say it again because it's very practical and very relevant for us. A Jew, for instance, in Russia, was thrown into prison for no reason, no crime. He didn't do a thing. They threw him into prison and now they took away his tefillin. He's sitting in t- prison and he's not able to put on tefillin. What does Mesiris Nefesh mean? Break out of jail and go get tefillin? He can't. Mesiris Nefesh would mean tefillin is seven miles away. I'll run, walk the seven miles to get the tefillin. It's possible. It's difficult. It's a lot of self-sacrifice, but it's possible. I'll do it. That's what Mesiris Nefesh means. What is the scenario when Hashem puts somebody in a situation that you can't do the mitzvah? You can't. The person is thrown into prison. He's locked in prison. May, you know, you say, okay, he did something wrong and therefore he's thrown into prison. It's his fault. The guy did nothing from the mere fact that he's a Jew. He was beaten, thrown into prison, and now... He's not able to put on tefillin. What does Hashem want? Does Hashem want him to put on tefillin? No. Because Hashem put him in a situation where he cannot wear tefillin. So what does Hashem want from him? What Hashem wants from him, and this is the Mesidus Nefesh, and this is what Pesach Sheni is all about. What Hashem wants from him is that he should be depressed 
and he should be upset and he should be not able, able to handle it from the fact that he's not able to put on tefillin. A typical from a Jew, if he comes along and he says, you know, listen, I'm locked in prison, I'm potter. I don't have to put on tefillin. Okay, Hashem doesn't want, fine. That's not what Hashem wants. Of course Hashem put you in that situation. But why did Hashem put you in that situation? What does Hashem want from you to do in that situation? What Hashem wants from you at that moment is to feel bad, to feel terrible, and to be upset that you can't put on tefillin. You know, they tell a story in one of the wars, whether it was in Russia, in Europe, whatever. So according to Allah, you have to eat treif. You have to eat treif for food to survive, to koch nefesh. There was no kosher food. They were running away in more time. Halachically, they were allowed to eat treif. They even made a brach on it because they had to eat it. So there was one guy eating treif for meat and you know, there's an expression in Yiddish, Fasmakevin the Lippen. Fasmakevin, I don't know if that's Yiddish or Russian, but Lippen for sure is Yiddish. Fasmakevin the Lippen means, you know, when something's really good by kids' ice cream, mm, you, lick, you lick your tongue and make good good to the last drop. So this Jew, who is Nabachidin Chazer, was Fasmakevin the Lippen. He was, mm, you know, so his friend went over to him and said to him, I don't understand you. Mainly you have to eat treif. That's the situation Hashem put it into you. But you have to enjoy it. Do you really have to enjoy it? Why are you enjoying it? At least cry that you have to eat it. Yes, you have to eat it. Torah says, you're Tomei, you can't bring the carbon Pesach. Yes, the Torah said that. But what does the Torah want from you now? The Torah doesn't want you to come along and say, okay. Torah said no, so no. So I won't bring the carbon Pesach. That attitude is terrible in Yiddishkeit. What teaches us this attitude? Pesach Sheini. Pesach Sheni teaches a Jew to come and to scream to Hashem, Lama Nigora. Hashem doesn't bring Mashiach yet. Okay, so the Jew says, listen, if God would want to bring Mashiach, let him bring Mashiach. I'm not stopping him. Is that what Hashem wants? Hashem puts us in a situation of Golus because Hashem wants us to scream we want Mashiach now. Not sloganizing. We want Mashiach now. In fact, it's brought down in Kabbalah that the first Pesach, Pesach Rishon, represents the going out of Mitzrayim. Pesach Sheni, it says in Kabbalah, represents the second Geula, which represents the coming of Mashiach. There was one Gula Mitzrayim, and then you have the ultimate Gula Mashiach. Pesach Rishon represents the first Gula out of Mitzrayim. Pesach Sheni represents the second Gula when Mashiach coming soon. Where do we get that from? Pesach Sheni. What's Pesach Sheni? Pesach Sheni means the Jew is screaming out to Hashem, Lom and Nigara, why should we suffer? Why should we be in Golis? Why do I have to suffer from being in Golis? I don't want to. That's what Hashem wants from us. That's our Mesir Esnafit today in Golis. And that's what Hashem wants. And therefore, yeah, we can't jump from the floor to the ground, from the floor to the roof. That's impossible. Granted, it's impossible. And Hashem doesn't want you to do that because it's impossible to do. What does Hashem want you to do? 
to cry and to feel bad that you can't do it. To come screaming to Meshe Rabbeinu, Lama Nigara, why do we have to suffer from the mere fact that we can't do what we want to do? We want to do it. And when the Jews don't do that, and they say, okay, Hashem, you know, you told us in the desert only one Pesach, and uh, that's it. Until we come into Eretz Yisrael, we'll do the second Pesach. The Torah calls it Gnus and Shal Yisrael. This is the negativity of the Jewish people. It's bad. And therefore, the Torah says, I'm not going to begin the book of Bamidbo with that. With negativity? Big negativity. What was the negativity? Hashem said, to, you don't have to do it. But by Hashem, by Hashem and the Jew is unique. The relationship with the Jew and Hashem has to be. You know, I always tease the kids when they're out of school. I always tease my grandkids and other kids. They say, I understand you guys. There's no school today. You guys should be walking with posters outside school. We want school today. I always tease them. I said, what do you, what, what, why is it, what do you mean there's no school? You guys have to go and scream, we want school. I won't tell you what they tell me. That's not relevant. <laughs> but the bottom line is, Ideally, think about it. Isn't that what they should be doing? Isn't that what a Jew that cannot do Kiddush Shavani, isn't that what he should be doing? And coming to our situation now, Hashem put us in a situation we can't go to school. Hashem put us in a situation now we can't go to show. We can't go to show. We can't go learn classes in person. Who put us in that situation? Not us. Hashem put us in that situation. So a Jew can come along and say, okay, listen. You know, this is what Hashem wants. That's not why Hashem did this. Why is Hashem putting us that we can't daven with the minion now? Why is Hashem putting us that we can't go to, kids can't go to school or to camp or whatever? Why is it Hashem's putting us in a situation which is so terrible? You know why? Hashem wants to see how we react. Are we complacent with it? Or are we really upset with it? And we can't wait to go back to show. A guy, a guy said, now, lately, it's a joke, but a guy said, you know, I feel very bad. I can't listen to my wife. I said, why? He said, because whenever I was home, I got in the way. My wife said, go to shul. Get out of here and go to shul. He said, now I can't listen to her. I would love to listen to her, but I can't. This is what Hashem wants. And the Baal Shem Tev said, and the Rebbe always quoted this, in the place where the person's will is, that's where they are. What does that mean? The Rebbe said many times, very interesting, by Fabrengen, the Rebbe said everything, you know, terror is half chassidus, half hidden, half revealed. Remember, like we discussed, half ocean, half dry land, half revealed terror, half hidden terror. The Rebbe says everything in Chassidus and Kabbalah is found in the Gemara, in the revealed Torah. Everything in the revealed Torah is found in the hidden Torah. Just like the Gemara says everything in the ocean is in the dry land, everything in the dry land is in the ocean. It's two worlds, two half of one world. So the Rebbe said, when the Rebbe quoted the saying of the Baal Shem Tev, In the place where the person's will is, that's where he is. The Rebbe brought a proof from a very open Gemara and open Halacha. On Shabbos, there's a din. You can only go up to 2,000 amas, 2,000 cubits outside the city. You know, after the last house, you can only, it's called Tchum Shabbos. You can only go 2,000 amas out of the city. So Gemara says, what happens if somebody needs to go further than that? So before Shabbos, they put uh, bread at the end, right before the end of the 2000 Amis, they put some challah or bread, whatever. 
And then on Shabbos, they're allowed to go another 2,000 dollars. And the Gemara says, why? Really, the person himself should be standing there if he wants to, before Shabbos and then be able to go another 2,000 dollars. But the Gemara said, we're going to be nice guys. A person's mind is in his food. You know, the way to a man's heart, not women's, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. You know, you get the man you, through food, that's the, why do you think people come to show? Trust me, not for the speech, not the daven, basically for the kiddush. So uh, what a person's mind is in his food. So the Gemara says, when a person puts his food there before Shabbos, next to the 2,000 cubits, it's like he's standing there. And if he's standing there, he can go another 2,000 hours. So the Rebbe said, that's exactly what the Bashan Tov said. I'll never forget, there was a Simchas Torah once, in the middle of Akafis. All of a sudden, the Rebbe started speaking. Normally during Akafis, there were no speeches. The Rebbe said, quoted the Bashan Tov, that said, and the Rebbe said, right now, we want to be in Yerushalayim. And based on that, we are in Yerushalayim. That's what the Rebbe said, we're in Yerushalayim because that's where we want to be. And we're going to have our coffers now in Yerushalayim, basically in 770, but because we want to be in, in Yerushalayim. And then he said, Hebron, that's where we are. And the Rebbe said clearly, the Rebbe, by the Rebbe, there's no jokes. The Rebbe said, we want to be in Yerushalayim, we're in Yerushalayim. We want to be in Hebron, we're in Hebron. And there, there, that's where we're making hakafis. So Hashem said, What does that mean? A person wants to be in school. That's where they are. You want to be in shul. Not saying. You want to be in shul. Then you're in shul. You want to have a carbon Pesach. You'll have a carbon Pesach. It's better to be outside the classroom looking in than inside the classroom looking out. If you're outside the classroom looking in, that's where you want to be. If you're inside the classroom looking out, that's where you want to be. What's Pesach Shemi now? Summing it all up. Pesach Shemi teaches a Jew it's never too late. It's never too late. You could be impure. You could be far. You could be lochem, as the Rebbe says. The Rebbe emphasizes many times. Willingly impure. Willingly far away from, from Teira Mitzvahs. But if you come to you, you want to be there, that's where you are. David HaMelech says, and it's the famous nigging that the Rebbe taught, some nafshi. My soul is thirsty to you. My flesh is longing to you. In a dry, desolate land, without water. And the Governor Melech continues, which simply means, in a deeper sense at least, it should only be the will that in Yerushalayim, I should have the same longing I have for you, God, as I have in a dry, desolate land. When you're thirsty, that's when the longing of water is more than when you're standing near the water. Everybody knows, we mentioned this many times, if you don't eat breakfast until 10 o'clock every morning, on the fast day, 8 o'clock in the morning, you have a headache. You're hungry, you can't take it anymore. You don't eat anyway until 10 o'clock. And it's only 8 o'clock. What's the issue here? So the Gemara has an expression. The Gemara's expression is, Misha Yeshle Pas Pesali. A person that has bread in his basket is never hungry. You know why? Whenever he wants to go eat. When you don't have it, the longing is more. And this is what the Rebbe said, Samalacha Nafshi. David HaMelech said to Hashem, speaking when he was out of Yerushalayim, and he had the longing 
He had the longing to be in Yerushalayim. And David HaMelech says, Tzom alacha nafshi, kam alacha besari. My soul is longing to you. And he says, Kain bakredish chazisicha. David HaMelech says, I should only have the same longing when I'm there, when I'm there with you. What does this mean? Sometimes Hashem, you know, there's an expression in English. You know when you appreciate light? When you have a blackout. When you know when you appreciate something, is only when you don't have it. As long as you have it, you don't appreciate it. In this situation presently, we have to remember, Hashem is putting us now in this present situation. Because Hashem says, I don't want you now to daven with the minion. I don't want you now to go to school. What do I want? I don't want you to put on tefillin. I mean, in the analogy of the prison. Hashem said, I don't want you to do Kiddush Levana. I don't want you to put on tefillin. I don't want you to daven with the minion. What do I want? I want you to feel bad and upset that you can't do it. And this is the lesson of the whole Pesach Sheini. Number one, we have to keep in mind the Rebbe teaches us no matter how far you are, you're really close. You know, Chabad started the whole Kiruv movement in the 50s. Yeah, we were around in those days. Chabad started the Kiruv moment in the 50s and everybody, all the religious groups, all the religious organizations knocked it. Where you're dealing with these people, they're not religious, they're going to corrupt you. Now, there isn't a religious organization, Hasidic, Litvish, Marino, that doesn't have Kiruv. But they have an expression, they're doing Kiruv Rochaikim, bringing far, I mean, bringing close those that are far. And the Rebbe commented many times, it's a not true expression, it's an incorrect expression. A Jew is never far. A Jew is never far. You could be ultimately distant, distant, distant. Lochem. Willingly far. Pastor Shani says, you're not far. It's never too late. All you have to do is want to be close and you get close. I want, I heard a very nice word. It says, Kirchek Mizrach Mimayrev. Like the distance from east to west, Hashem should distance our Avedis. How far is east from west? Think about it. How far is east from west? The answer is one turnaround. One turnaround. You're going east for 50 miles. You turn around, just one turnaround you're already going west. There's an expression in the Zayar, man de nafal midarge ikramis. One that falls from his level is called dead. And Shmuel Levitin, I heard from my father, from others, that said the name of the Shmuel Levitin. What does it mean? And he gave a very beautiful, simple example. There's two people on a ladder. One's on step eight, the ones on step five, who is higher? And the answer is, it depends which direction they're going. If five is going up and eight is going down, five is higher than eight. It doesn't mean where you are. The question is, where are you going? Where are you going? Based on the direction you're going, that what makes it who you are, whom you are, and what you are. So again, l'chaim everybody, if anybody has any questions, they can ask questions now, l'chaim. We should internalize Pesach Sheni, we should internalize the lessons, and we should keep one thing in mind, we are never far. Uh -huh. What? L'chaim. L'chaim. L'chaim.
Baba, I have a question and a quandary now. But you're just talking about to feel bad that you cannot keep something. Not depressed. Right. They shouldn't feel bad. Jews should never be depressed. So how should they feel? As a woman who comes to my classes and she wants to keep Shabbos and her husband tells her you have to go in the car on Shabbos, he forces her to go and she calls me crying and I tell her, do you think that Hashem doesn't know you do not want to go into the car? Don't feel bad. Now I should tell her she should feel bad, worse, because she really does feel bad. So no. I tell you not to do this on purpose. Or doing somebody this, that eats, somebody that forced. One second. Somebody that eats on Yom Kippur, should feel bad, but not but knowing at the same time this is what Hashem wants. Yeah. Now I have to tell an interesting story about these classes, by the way, not the Zoom classes. I got a call last night from somebody from Columbus, Ohio. It's not an interesting story. I got a call last night from somebody in Columbus, Ohio. And he says to me, Are you Rabbi Schusterman in Beverly Hills? I say, Yeah. He said, You have classes online? He said, I said, Yeah. He said there's a guy by them that is making a seum. He don't call me yesterday. He says he's making a seum today. I'm a sechtetinus, a sechtetinus, and he told me that most of the tractate he learned from your classes online. The last time we learned tinus online, I believe, was something like 30 years ago. Whatever. And he says, you know what? He's having a zoom seum. And it would be very nice, I think it would be a surprise to him if you go on the Zoom and just show your face to him. I said, sure. He uh, emailed me the Zoom thing. I went on today. The guy was shocked out of his box. I mean, I, I don't even know who the guy is. He's in Columbus, so I don't even know who the guy is. And he says, yeah, I always mention you. I said, it's not me, it's the Rebbe speak, whatever. Anyway, but it was very interesting. <laughs> this guy I never met before was listening to the class, and he made a whole seam on Masech the Tainus. It was very, very nice. Anyway, men, don't forget to Davin Marv and to Svira. Um, once again, Monday night, the next Monday night class will be on Lag Ba'emer. We like for Bengen class in Lag Ba'emer, and then back to normal things go on. Um, as of now, we don't know anything about opening the shul or anything like that. People themselves don't know. And we'll just keep everybody informed. But it's not happening this week or next week, so just be upset that you can't be in show. Have a good night, everybody. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Good night. Hey, have a good Shabbos, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. Where are you going? You going to to the valley? No, no, we're gonna we're gonna bring the kedusha to here. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> the kedusha is here. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Good night. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.